We're going to take a look at how we should interpret results that confirm or disconfirm our predictions, and whether we should confirm or reject our hypothesis accordingly. Let's consider the hypothesis that all mothers-in-law are horrible. I formulated this hypothesis based on personal observations. To test the hypothesis, I came up with a research setup. I selected to measure horribleness using a rating scale, with the options likable, neutral, and horrible. I also decided to collect data from 10 colleagues in my department. With the research setup in place, I formulated the following prediction. If the hypothesis, all mothers-in-law are horrible, is true, then all 10 colleagues should choose the category horrible to describe their mother-in-law. OK, let's look at confirmation first. Suppose all 10 colleagues rated their mother-in-law as horrible. The prediction is confirmed. But this doesn't mean the hypothesis has been proven. It's easily conceivable that we will be proven wrong in the future. If we were to repeat the study, we might find a person that simply adores their mother-in-law. The point is that confirmation is never conclusive. The only thing we can say is that our hypothesis is provisionally supported. The more support from different studies, the more credence we afford a hypothesis. But we can never prove it. Let me repeat that. No scientific empirical statement can ever be proven once and for all. The best we can do is produce overwhelming support for a hypothesis. OK, now let's turn to disconfirmation. Suppose only 8 out of 10 colleagues rate their mother-in-law as horrible, and 2 actually rate her as neutral. Obviously, in this case, our prediction turned out to be false. Logically speaking, empirical findings that contradict the hypothesis should lead to its rejection. If our hypothesis states that all swans are white, and we then find black swans in Australia, we can very conclusively reject our hypothesis. In practice, however, especially in the social sciences, there are often plausible alternative explanations for our failure to confirm. These are in fact so easy to find that we rarely reject the hypothesis outright. In many cases, these explanations have to do with methodological issues. The research design or the measurement instrument wasn't appropriate. Maybe relevant background variables weren't controlled for, etc., etc. Coming back to our mother-in-law example, I could have made a procedural error while collecting responses from the two colleagues who rated their mother-in-law as neutral. Maybe I forgot to tell them that their responses were confidential, making them uncomfortable to choose the most negative category. If there are plausible methodological explanations for the failure to confirm, we preserve the hypothesis and instead choose to reject the auxiliary, implicit assumptions concerning the research design and the measurement. We investigate the original hypothesis again, only with a better research setup. Sometimes results do give rise to a modification of the hypothesis. Suppose that the eight colleagues who did have horrible mothers-in-law were all women, and the other two were men. Perhaps all mothers-in-law are indeed horrible, but only to their daughters-in-law. If we alter the hypothesis slightly by adding additional clauses, it only applies to daughters-in-law, then strictly speaking, we're rejecting the original hypothesis. Sort of. Of course, the new hypothesis is essentially the same as the original one, just not as general, and therefore not as strong. An outright rejection or radical adjustment of a hypothesis is actually very rare in the social sciences. Progress is made in very small increments, not giant leaps.